I hope that uh, you and your family are all in good health. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Aiden. I'm a graduate student um, in the Department of Astronomy at UCLA. Uh, I will be your presenter for tonight, but I, there are two other graduate students assisting me uh, running the chat, and that's Briley and Ronald. So thank you to Briley and Ronald. Uh, tonight's show is going to be themed towards the Perseids meteor shower, which peaks tomorrow night. Uh, and so hopefully, we're, we're hoping that this show will encourage you to go outside, uh, enjoy the night sky, and enjoy the meteors. All right, so as far as the structure of this show, um, this show is going to be broken up into two parts, and it's basically going to mirror the way we do our shows when we're in person. Uh, the first part is going to be uh, basically a science talk about the science behind meteor showers. I'm going to talk about what they are, uh, why they happen, and how you can see them. That'll be the first half, and then the second half will be a virtual, uh, a virtual planetarium show, a virtual night sky show, using the software uh, Stellarium. And with that, we'll show you the meteor shower, also show you some constellations, uh, planets, and more. Um, there won't be any live views of meteors tonight, so hopefully uh, this will just encourage you to go outside and see them for yourself, or you can join a, a stream maybe tomorrow night that does show live views of the meteors. Um, so please feel free at any time to comment in the chat. We'll do our best to, to answer your questions. I'll try to pause and answer some questions. Um, uh, uh, let's get started. All right, so what is the Perseids meteor shower? Actually, I'm going to disappear so you can pay attention to the show. So what is the Perseids meteor shower? Uh, this is a meteor shower that happens every year. It's annual. It happens every year in mid-August. Um, it peaks tomorrow night, but actually it has been sort of ramping up for a while. So for the last week or so, it has actually been producing meteors and increasing in intensity. And then after it peaks, it's going to last for about another week. So even if you don't make it outside tomorrow, you'll still be able to uh, see some meteors on other nights. Um, on an average year, this meteor shower will typically produce about 100 meteors per hour on the peak night. So that's about one or two meteors or, or shooting stars. Uh, per minute. Um, and that is if you're in a dark site and you observe in the morning. Um, this year, the number will be a little bit lower just because we have a quarter moon um, that is rising in the morning. But you'll still be able to hopefully see 50 to 60 meteors uh, per hour um, as long as you're at a, a dark site. Um, the Perseid meteor shower is generally considered the best for watching. Um, it doesn't always produce the most amount of meteors of all the meteor showers, but the thing is that it does occur in the summer. It occurs in August, so it's really nice and pleasant to go out and watch it. Um, the Geminids meteor shower that happens in December usually produces a few more meteors, uh, but most people don't want to go out and hang out on a, a cold December night to look at meteors. So the Perseids um, is really the best, and it's really the, like the old faithful of meteor showers. You might be wondering why it is called the Perseids. So uh, meteor showers are named basically uh, by where they appear to come from in the sky. And so if you were to take a picture of all the meteors that occurred on one night uh, from the Perseids, and you were to put all those pictures together into just one image, what you would get is an image like you're seeing here on the left, uh, which was taken in Slovakia by an incredible photographer. And what you see is that these meteors, uh, these shooting stars, will form basically very much a shower pattern, and they'll all appear to basically come from one point um, in the sky. And the Perseids appear to come from the constellation Perseus. And so in the constellation Perseus, on the right, we'll see is the radiant, uh, where the meteors appear to come from. I'll show you that in the night sky uh, show later. Um, but this is just apparent. So you know these meteors are not actually coming from the constellation Perseus. This is just where they appear to come from. All right, so what is a shooting star? Or what is a typical meteor? Um, you know, people call them shooting stars, but in reality, that they have really have nothing to do with stars, right? Um, they're not actually falling stars or anything. They're actually quite small pieces of basically dust and debris. So the typical meteor is actually only about the size of a grain of sand or, or even just a small pebble. Um, they first sort of start to light up when they hit the atmosphere about 50 to 75 miles up, and they can enter the atmosphere at speeds between 25 to 160,000 miles an hour. 
Um, so going that fast, they would go between Los Angeles and New York in just over a minute. So they enter at a tremendous speed, and even though they're really small, uh, they heat up. They heat up to uh, thousands of degrees Fahrenheit, and so these just small pieces of debris can create quite a noticeable trail, um, even though they're very small. Um, you might be wondering where these meteors come from. Why does a shower happen? The Perseids meteors actually come from a comet. And that comet is this comet Swift-Tuttle. Um, it's shown in the picture right here. This comet last visited our solar system in, or last entered the inner solar system in 1992. So this is a picture from the last time we saw it. Um, and so the meteors that we're seeing, they're called meteoroids before they enter the atmosphere. Uh, these meteoroids are basically debris that is coming off of the comet um, as it goes around its orbit in our solar system. Um, the, the comet Swift-Tuttle is not just any comet, but it's actually, uh, it creates a meteor shower because it's a comet that crosses the Earth's orbit. And so almost all meteor showers are caused by comets that cross the Earth's orbit somewhere. Um, there's uh, only two that I think are actually caused by asteroids, but most of them are caused by comets. And so in both of these images, you can see the orbital path. Well, first you can see our solar system. So you can see the orbits of the planets in our solar system. Uh, the purple in here is Mercury, and then we have Venus, Earth, Mars. So the, the orbit of the comet actually passes through Earth's orbit at one point. Um, and it only does this once every 133 years. So um, that's a pretty long time. So we last saw this comet in 1992. Before that, we only first saw it when it was discovered back in the 1860s. So we've only actually seen this comet um, twice. Uh, let me give you a little bit of a better illustration of this. All right, so now what we're looking at is, again, a 3D visualization of our solar system. And on the inside here are uh, the inner planets, Mercury in purple, Venus orange, um, Earth blue. We zoom out, you'll see the planets in the outer solar system. Jupiter is in yellow, um, Saturn green, Neptune out here in dark blue. And this white orbit is the orbit, orbit of the comet Swift-Tuttle. Uh, so if we zoom in here, you'll see that basically this comet crosses our orbit at one point in the year. And that point is in August. So if I change the date here to August, you'll see that the Earth is currently basically passing through this stream. And the strength of the meteor shower will basically be determined by how much debris is in this stream um, at any one time. Um, all this white stuff is the debris left over by the comet. It usually is orbiting uh, around the solar system for thousands of years. So the meteors you see, uh, it may have been thousands of years since they actually left the comet um, before they enter the Earth's atmosphere. All right. So let me pause for a moment, see if there's any questions I can answer. All right. Uh, and each, so I think I see a few questions now. All these are your questions I'm going to answer. What's the best time to see the meteors? Um, how many you, you can expect to see? Um, almost all of these are questions I'm going to answer. Um, any tips for photographers? Um, for photographers, I think I'm going to recommend pretty much the same things I'll recommend to, to other observers, but you'll be wanting to take basically just tons and tons of sequential uh, long exposures um, to catch meteors since you, you never know when they're going to happen. And you'll want to use as wide a lens as possible when you do that. Um, but we'll talk more about um, a lot of these questions in a little bit. So I'm going to keep going. All right, so some of you may know that actually we were recently visited by a comet, um, and that was the comet uh, C2020 F3 NEOIS. You could see this best um, in July. It was actually one of the brightest comets that we've had in years. Um, in July, in late July, you could actually see this with your naked eye uh, in LA, although it was really, really difficult to see. 
Um, and then in darker places, uh, it was completely visible to the naked eye. Um, this is a beautiful comet, but this is not a comet that will actually cause any meteor showers. And the reason is that this comet doesn't um, cross the Earth's orbit. This is also a long period comet. So you may have heard that the comet Neowise is on a almost 7,000 year orbit. Um, so the, the, the periods of comets that actually cause meteor showers are much, much shorter. And these short period comets are thought to originate basically out in this uh, zone called the Kuiper Belt. So you might know that there is an asteroid belt in our solar system. The asteroid belt is basically between uh, the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. But we also have a Kuiper Belt um, that is out past the orbit of Neptune. And this Kuiper Belt basically consists of rocky and icy bodies um, uh, that can be basically knocked into uh, the inner solar system by interactions with Neptune. So there's basically this big body of comet-like objects out in the Kuiper Belt, and through interactions with the large planet Neptune, they can be thrown into the inner solar system um, and show up as comets. And Pluto is actually a member, is probably the most well-known member of the Kuiper Belt. Um, what are comets made of? So, like I said, you probably know they're icy. So they're basically balls of ice, dust, and rock. Uh, when you think of ice on Earth, you probably think of just water ice, but comets are made of ice uh, of a lot of different kinds. So they're made of water ice. They're also made of dry ice, frozen carbon dioxide. Um, other, other chemicals, they're made of frozen uh, carbon monoxide, ammonia, methane. Um, all things that freeze at super, super cold temperatures. And when they approach the sun, they heat up and many of those ices basically start to vaporize. And so what we're seeing here is, is a different comet now. This is the comet 67P shuyumov gerasmenka And on the left here, you're seeing images from the Rosetta mission that the European Space Agency uh, sent to, to this comet in 2014 uh, through 2016. So as this comet basically approaches the sun, um, you see all these gases coming off of it um, on the left, all these outbursts. So those ices are vaporizing. And when they vaporize, they'll also kick off dust um, and little, little rocks. And those will basically become the meteorites or the meteors that we're seeing. Um, on the right here, you can see what kind of looks like almost a snowstorm. Um, you're actually seeing a few things here. Again, this is from the Rosetta mission. Uh, on a, on the top right, you're seeing some stars that are going by in the background. You're also seeing some cosmic radiation that's hitting the camera and causing all these white specks. But some of what you're seeing actually is dust um, and ice basically coming off of this comet. Um, and those are basically material that could become the meteoroids that make up the meteor shower. Um, you might not know that comets actually have two tails. So they have... Uh, both a dust tail and an ion tail, or the ion tail is also called the gas tail. Um, what you should think of is that the sun is actually emitting basically a solar wind. Um, so the sun is constantly streaming out these high energy particles, high energy radiation. And when those hit the comet, they'll strip off a uh, gas, which will go straight out away from the comet in an ion tail. And then the dusty material um, won't quite go straight out. It'll usually form this curved tail. Um, and so you can actually distinctly see these two different tails, even in, in amateur images. If we look back at comet Neowise, you can just see the faint ion tail uh, just right here, and then the dust tail um, going away like this. Might be surprising that actually the comet tail basically always, or the, the comet's tail always points away from the sun. So it can point in the direction the comet is going. So when the comet's going away from the sun, the tails will actually be out in front of the comet, uh, more or less. All right, so what does a Perseid meteor actually look like? Um, I think most people have seen a shooting star um, before, and you, you probably know that they're kind of blink and you'll miss it events. So they come in super, super fast, um, and because of that, they burn up very, very quickly. Um, they usually last less than a second. Every once in a while, you'll see one that actually lasts quite a long time. Um, and they usually leave this actual visible tail. And what that tail is, is the, the meteor 
is basically ionizing gas in our atmosphere. It's heating it up really hot, and so it'll, it'll leave this visible trail, um, sometimes for several seconds after the meteor passes. For very, very large meteors, um, it, they can actually leave smoke trails that last for minutes even after uh, the meteor has passed. Uh, but you have to be pretty lucky to see those. Um, meteors can also actually have different colors. Now, most small meteors, um, <clears throat> most faint meteors, are too faint to actually trigger color vision. Um, so you won't be able to see colors with those. But brighter meteors, called uh, fireballs, will sometimes have a distinct color. Um, and that color is determined by a few things. It's determined by the speed at which uh, the meteors enter our atmosphere. It's also determined by their composition. So uh, different meteors can sometimes have different compositions, and those will cause different colors. Um, they won't quite be as distinct as these colors, right? So meteors will never, never, never really be like neon uh, blue or neon purple or something, but you'll sometimes be able to notice some slight color to them. Um, maybe you're wondering, can meteors ever produce a sound? Um, that is pretty rare, but they actually can sometimes. So bright meteors, um, these fireball events, really bright ones, they'll sometimes be able, uh, they'll be large enough to cause a sonic boom, but that's not what you're, what you will hear when the meteor is actually coming down, right? Because these events happen uh, miles and miles above our head and it takes time for the sound to travel. So if a, a meteor actually produces a sonic boom, you're not gonna hear it for probably um, a few minutes after the meteor actually happens, after you actually see it. But for a long time, people have reported uh, buzzing noises or like sizzling noises when meteors enter the atmosphere. And for a long time, people thought, basically everyone's just imagining this because um, we, we didn't really know of a mechanism. Um, but it's now thought that actually uh, these sounds can be produced by radio waves basically interacting with other objects on the ground. So we do know that meteors produce these very low frequency radio waves. And it's thought that basically these uh, radio waves can sometimes induce vibrations um, into objects. And so they might be responsible for creating sounds, but it's not um, fully understood. Um, this is actually, I'll play a little small sound clip of the very low frequency radio waves. Um, it's kind of a slightly unpleasant sound, but it'll give you an idea. All right. So let me actually go to the next. So uh, before I talk about how to see the Perseids, I'm gonna pause again, check if there's any questions to answer. Okay, so someone asked, where is the comet right now? So the comet Swift-Tuttle is right now way out in the outer solar system. Um, at its furthest extent, it goes out to the orbit of Pluto. Um, so I don't know where exactly it is in the orbit, but it's, it's in the far reaches of the orbit right now. It's far away from the inner solar system. Um, will there be fewer and fewer meteors each year? Um, over the super long term, maybe, but it really jumps around from year to year, um, just based on the density of the streams that come. Uh, so on like a hundred year basis, um, it's pretty much going to remain the same. Um, it just really depends on like where the moon is and how bright it is more than the, how much, how many meteors are produced. Um, someone asked, will, will pieces large enough, uh, will there be pieces that you can recover on earth? So very, very, very few meteors actually make it to the ground and become meteorites. Um, I would say greater than 99% of the meteors you see at night will just completely dissolve in the atmosphere and just be blown away as dust. Um, for a meteor to actually make it to the ground, it has to be relatively large, um, probably you know the size of a large marble, maybe the size of a fist before it will actually make it to the ground at all. Um, but it depends on how it enters the atmosphere and uh, its composition as well. 
All right. So we've talked about how uh, meteor, uh, meteor showers are produced. Let's talk about how to see the Perseids. All right, so first thing you're gonna wanna do is just try to find a dark location. Um, and I know that's, that's hard for many of us in, in LA, it's very bright, um, but you, you wanna do the best you can. So um, if you're able to, it's a good idea to try to drive away from the city, um, find somewhere rural, and, and make sure you have a clear view. So don't be tucked into the forest with a bunch of trees overhead. When you do go out, you'll, you'll just want to look like generally overhead. So I know I talked about a radiant, but you really don't want to actually look straight at the radiant um, because meteors will be coming in all over the atmosphere. Um, so there's really not a good reason to look directly at the radiant, but you can look just generally in like a northeast direction. Um, observing actually does get better in the morning. So you will want to try to observe it as late as possible, as late as you're willing to. Um, midnight or early morning is best. This year, the moon rises in the early morning, so um, probably around midnight is, is best. Um, but the reason for this is that at sunset, you're basically looking out Earth's back, uh, back window. So at sunset, you're looking at where the Earth just was in its orbit. And at sunrise, you're looking at where the Earth is going in its orbit. Um, and so it's kind of like the front and back windshield of a car. Uh, you're going to see more rain on your front windshield than your back windshield. Uh, so it's better to observe in the morning. And then the last thing I'd recommend is just make sure you're like very comfortable and patient when you're observing these because you do, you do have to be patient. Um, so you, if you're not comfortable, you're not gonna be patient. Uh, so just make sure you're, you're as comfortable as possible. All right. Um, Here's a map of actual light pollution in Southern California. Um, you can find maps like this on the site darksitefinder.com in case you don't live in Southern California, but this will give you a rough idea of what light pollution is like in your area. So obviously in Los Angeles, light pollution is quite bad. It's probably the worst it is um, anywhere in the United States. Uh, so. Within the city limits of LA, I probably wouldn't recommend trying to see the meteor shower because you're, you're only going to see like the brightest fireballs. Um, so if you don't want to spend too much time driving, I would recommend uh, driving to places like Malibu um, from Los Angeles um, or up into the San Gabriel Mountains near Mount Wilson. Um, you can also drive north um, to the Los Padres National Forest up near Santa Barbara. That's a good place to go. If you really want to make a trip out to it, probably the best location is Joshua Tree, um, way out here. Although I, there might be some smoke in Joshua Tree right at the moment, so you, you will want to check that before you go out there. Um, okay, and the very last thing I want to mention before I go into the night sky show is something called meteor storms. So on most years, meteor uh, showers are pretty tame. You, you see a, a, an abundance of meteors but, you know, they're a little quiet. Um, but every once in a while, there are some truly uh, amazing meteor showers that happen. They're actually called meteor storms when they're over a thousand meteors per hour. Um, a really notable event like this happened in 1833 with a Leonid meteor shower. Uh, this is an engraving to give you an idea what that meteor shower was like or what that meteor storm was like. It's estimated that during that uh, storm, there was 240,000 meteors per hour. So that's like uh, 60 meteors per second. Um, apparently reports from this night said that the meteors were only like half, half as abundant as snowflakes in a, a snowstorm. Um, what's also incredible to think about is that this time in 1833, people didn't actually really know what meteors were. Some people thought they were actually just uh, gases like exploding in the atmosphere. So to see an event like this at this time, that probably would have been a truly scary event. Um, back in 1966, there was also a very notable uh, meteor storm. That one slightly less, probably 140,000 per hour, um, but that's still like 40 per second. These events are pretty rare. They probably happen only maybe a few times uh, per century. I think back in 2002, there was um, a Leonid meteor shower that was, you know, just um, just brilliant enough to be classified as a meteor storm, but they don't happen that often. So I would just recommend to stay in tune with uh, meteor showers 
so that when an event like this does happen, uh, you don't miss it. All right, I'll pause more time. Questions? Um, someone asked how much magnification is needed to see meters with clarity. So when, with a meteor shower, you don't want to use any telescopes or any binoculars to view them. It's just best to be viewed with the naked eye. You don't want to use any equipment. It's one of the few things in astronomy that it's better just with your eye. Um, does your time zone affect when the best time to look is? Um, not really. Basically, it's going to be morning for you. Um, whenever morning is, that's all that really matters. Um, Yep. Okay. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and transition to our, our night sky show. Okay. And for the night sky show tonight, I'm using a program called Stellarium. If you're not familiar with Stellarium, uh, this is a completely free software. You can find it on the web. You can download it. I think it's also available for your phone. I really highly recommend this, this software. All of you can basically download this and use it if you want to. And I think it's one of the, like, the most intuitive ways um, to check out the night sky or just to understand the way the night sky works. All right, so I figured most of the viewers are probably in LA. So I made our landscape Los Angeles and we're actually in Griffith Park, um, a big Griffith observatory. Um, I just want to orient you on the directions right now. So generally south uh, is downtown Los Angeles. Uh, to the west would be where UCLA is, uh, Santa Monica is the Hollywood sign to the northwest. North is basically Griffith Observatory. And to the east we have the San Gabriel Mountains. And the time right now is the current time, about 7.30. What you're going to see is exactly what you're going to see um, tonight. So if you go outside right after... Uh, this show, what I'm going to show you is what you'll see. Um, and if you're not in LA, this is all completely applicable to you. As long as you're in the Northern Hemisphere, you're basically going to see the same things. All right, so let me go ahead and advance time a little bit. The sun will go down. All right, and some stars and planets will start to come out. Go ahead to, uh, the sun is, is completely down. Okay, and I have set the light pollution to accurately uh, represent um, LA light pollution. So LA light pollution is quite bad. Um, it's not actually, as, I don't think it's actually as bad as um, this, this image would imply, but it's pretty bad. And so for that reason, I'm going to actually tune the light pollution down a little bit um, so we can see a few more stars. All right, so this is more like a rural sky now. Um, it's never this dark in LA, but that's okay. Uh, what I want to start looking at is probably one of the most well-known constellations, and that is the Big Dipper. Um, so here's the Big, Big Dipper. I'll turn on constellation lines. Uh, and so the Big Dipper is basically this spoon looking um, constellation. Actually, the Big Dipper is not a constellation. The Big Dipper is an asterism. An asterism um, is basically a pattern of stars in the sky that it's very recognizable. So the Big Dipper is an asterism and it's part of the constellation Ursa Major, which is a good constellation for us to start on uh, because it is the Great Bear and uh, usually we're the Bruins. So. Um, right, so this is one of the most well-known um, asterisms. Um, but what, what I want to do is use it as a pointer to find uh, the North Star. So there's two stars at the bottom of the dipper here called Merrick and Doobie. And they basically are the pointers to find the North Star. So if you take these two stars and you follow a line created by them, they'll eventually land at the North Star, Polaris, which is directly above uh, almost directly above Griffith here. Um, right, and so the, the North Star is basically almost the point at which 
the Earth's axis spins around. So if I were to uh, progress the night really fast, you'll watch and see that Polaris basically stays in one spot and all the constellations just rotate around it. Okay. Um, so Polaris is actually one of the stars in the constellation Ursa Minor, the Little Bear. Um, it's kind of a hard constellation to see. This is the Little Dipper, but it's kind of hard to notice as the Little Dipper because one of the stars that creates the Dipper is actually really faint. Um, speaking of faint, a lot of people think that Polaris is like the brightest star in the sky. That's not true at all. Um, Polaris is actually, I think, the 50th brightest star. Um, so it, it, that's, that's, you know, that's just a, a falsehood. It's not a very bright star. So if you end up you know, following uh, the brightest star to go north, you'll probably end up following a planet or something. A um, couple of fun facts about the North Star. Uh, it's actually not one star. Polaris is a system of three stars. And you might be surprised to learn that actually um, multiple star systems are very, very common in the universe. So about half of stars are thought to be in multiple star systems, and Polaris is one of them. Another interesting fact is that uh, the North Star does not always stay the same. So over the course of about 26,000 years, um, the axis of Earth, the ax axis of Earth's rotation actually moves across the, the sky. Um, and when the pyramids were built about 5,000 years ago, uh, the North Star was actually this star over here called Thuban in the constellation Draco. So over the course of 26,000 years, it makes a pretty big circle in the sky. Um, North Polaris has only been the North Star for the last uh, basically 1,000 years. Um, and it'll be closest to being the North Star in the year 2100. And after that, it'll get farther and farther away from the North um, axis of our, of our planet. OK, so that's uh, what I'm going to show you in the north for now. And actually, what I want to do now is turn to the south. And the south is really where uh, the action is happening in the summer sky. Um, I'm actually going to change our landscape just to get rid of this tree. But it's all the same. And what I want to point out for you now is the constellation Scorpius, which is my favorite constellation. We'll turn on the lines, and this is Scorpius the Scorpion. So it appears almost directly south after sunrise, uh, after sunset. You'll notice that it has this uh, big, long arch, and then it hooks up, and the stinger of the Scorpion is here. Pincers are up here. Turn on the art for you to give you an idea. Um, if you've seen the movie uh, Disney's Moana. This constellation is actually in that movie as Maui's fish hook. And so in Hawaiian star lore, uh, the constellation Scorpius is actually um, the, the fish hook of the demigod Maui. Um, so this is actually shown in that movie. All right. So this is a, a, a nice constellation. I'm going to show you a few interesting features in it. First off, the brightest star in this constellation is Antares, um, this red one right here. You'll notice that it's red actually to your eye. And Antares is actually a red giant. So it's not a very old star. It's only about 10 to 15 million years old. Um, but it is a very, very massive star. So it's about uh, 12 times the mass of our sun. And you might be surprised to learn that larger stars actually live much shorter lives than uh, smaller stars. So our sun um, will live about 10 billion years, and it's four and a half billion years old right now. Antares is only like 10 million years old. It's actually nearing the end of its life. Um, so it lives a much shorter amount of time. The star is so large that if you were to put it where the sun is, it would actually engulf um, all of the inner planets, including Mars. Um, so it's really a huge star. It's over 100,000 times more luminous than the sun. Um, and so in probably several thousand years, it'll die. Uh, it's impossible to say when. Uh, it'll die, and it'll become uh, a supernova. 
Uh, and so a supernova is basically a giant explosion that happens when stars die. And when I, when I say they die, I mean they run out of fuel. Uh, so it'll run out of fuel. There'll be a massive explosion um, as the star is basically crushing itself. Um, and it'll be very, very bright. Um, it'll probably be visible in the daytime when that happens. Um, but there won't be any danger to Earth because this is actually 500 light years away from us. It's a massive distance. It takes light 500 years uh, to reach us. Okay, I want to point out um, two other things in this constellation, and that, are, that is some open clusters. So if you look towards the tail, you'll see uh, some open clusters here. Um, one of these is Ptolemy's cluster, and the other is the butterfly cluster. These are clusters that you can see with uh, your naked, or not with your, well, you can see them with your naked eye if you're in a very dark spot, but in LA you can see these clusters um, with a pair of binoculars. Um, these are actually groupings of young stars that were just recently born together. Actually, they're about 100 million years old, I think. Um, and the sun would have formed in, in a group like this, but the, old, uh, the sun is very old now, and so it's basically lost its, the cluster that it was born in. All right, I want to point out to you the planets now. Um, and these are going to be very, very prominent in the night sky. Um, and that, the, the two planets that are up right now in the evening are Jupiter and Saturn. I really recommend looking at these with a pair of binoculars. If you do look at them with a pair of binoculars, what you'll see are the moons of Jupiter. Um, you can see all four of the largest moons of Jupiter with binoculars, Io, Callisto, Ganymede, uh, and Europa. You'll see these as basically just as points of light with a pair of binoculars. Um, they'll just be points of light. These are very interesting objects in themselves. So, uh, so Io is the most volcanic place in our solar system. Europa is an icy moon that has a um, subsurface ocean that we think could sustain microbial life. And Ganymede is the largest moon in the entire solar system. It's actually larger than Mercury. Um, if you look at Saturn with a pair of binoculars, you might be able to see the rings, although you might not just because um, it's hard to hold your hand steady. But if you look even with just a basic small telescope or um, a small pair of binoculars, if you can put them on a tripod, you'll actually be able to see the rings of uh, Saturn, um, or at least be able to tell that maybe Saturn has ears. Maybe you won't be able to quite tell that they're rings, but you'll notice something's a little off with Saturn. Um, these two planets are going to be brighter than almost all the other stars in the sky, so they're very, very prominent um, tonight. Okay, and then the last thing I want to show you in uh, the southern sky here is another constellation, Sagittarius, which the asterism for is the teapot. So that's this asterism right here. It looks like a little teapot, basically. Um, so the handle is in the back left. Uh, the spout is over here. Um, and this area of the sky is actually very interesting. And I'm going to turn down the light pollution even more now. So if you're in a dark area, what will come out eventually is the Milky Way. And this is actually the area of the sky where the center of the Milky Way is. So I will go ahead and show you the exact center. So this point, uh, called Sagittarius A star, is actually the center of our Milky Way. Um, it's actually a massive black hole, uh, millions of times the mass of our sun. You won't be able to see anything there with um, your naked eye or basically any telescopes. Um, but this is actually pretty interesting for UC uh, astronomy at UCLA, because we have a big group at UCLA um, that studies the galactic center, the center of our galaxy. Um, they study the black hole and also the stars that go around uh, the black hole. Um, and because this area of the sky is the center of the Milky Way, there's tons and tons of objects to see around here. So uh, you'll need a telescope, but there's globular clusters, there's nebula. Uh, the Eagle Nebula is actually up here. Um, the Eagle Nebula is where the famous Hubble picture, the, the Pillars of Creation, was taken. There's tons and tons of astronomical objects you can see here if you do have a telescope. All right, I'm going to pause.
see if there's any questions. Um, so there's a question, does a star make noise when it dies? So in space, you, you can't really hear noise because um, there's nothing for the, the noise to travel through. But in a sense, yes. So there would be a massive explosion um, uh, with actually, so when these supernova explosions go off, they emit more energy than the entire galaxy for just a fraction of a second. Um, and so they, they do make quite a big bang, although you probably wouldn't be able to hear it if you were actually in space. All right, I keep moving along. And so um, now what we're gonna do is follow the, the path of the Milky Way. I'm gonna change my landscape uh, back to LA. All right, so we're gonna uh, continue following the Milky Way, see more constellations. Uh, what I'm gonna show you next is what's called the Summer Triangle. It's an asterism. Uh, this triangle will be pretty much directly overhead um, after sunset. It's um, formed by three bright stars, Vega, Deneb, and Altair. These are the three brightest stars in three constellations, and those constellations are Cygnus the Swan, uh, Lyra the Lyre, and Altair um, the Eagle, or sorry, Achilla the Eagle. Um, this is just a, a, basically a signature um, asterism of summer. When you see these three stars up in the night sky, um, you know it's summer in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, Vega here, it's sometimes people call Vega uh, the most important star in astronomy other than the sun. Um, that's not really because Vega itself is a very special star, but just because a lot of astronomical firsts have been done with the star Vega. So Vega was the first star that there was ever a picture of. Um, I think it was the first star that we ever took a spectra of. It, I think it was one of the first stars that we measured the distance to. Um, and it has also been used as the brightness standard in astronomy for a long time. So um, you know, in the 20th, 20th century, Vega was basically uh, the brightness of which all other stars were was compared to. All right, so that's the Summer Triangle, and we'll keep going following the Milky Way now, and we're going to get to constellation Perseus and Cassiopeia. And so the constellation Perseus is actually quite low in the sky now, and this is partly why it's best to observe the meteor showers in the morning. So I'll turn on the meteor shower radiance. And if I progress time, so now it's 10 p.m., 11 p.m., and midnight, you'll now see that the, uh, the constellation Perseus is rising and the radiant of the Perseus meteor shower is rising as well. So let me turn on the constellation lines. So here's the constellation uh, Perseus. Perseus is actually not a very bright constellation. So if you're looking in this area, I would actually recommend looking at the constellation Cassiopeia. Constellation Cassiopeia has a very signature uh, W and it's made of these very bright stars. So I would actually recommend looking for this rather than the constellation Perseus. And then the radiant of the meteor shower will be just below, um, just below Cassiopeia. Um, in mythology, all the constellations here, or most of them, are related to each other. So uh, the constellation Andromeda is nearby. Um, Perseus, of course, is the hero that saves the or that saves the princess Andromeda while riding the horse Pegasus, another constellation. Andromeda's parents are Cepheus and Cassiopeia, these other two constellations. And the princess was saved from the monster Cetus, um, which is just rising there. Okay, so uh, Stellarium does simulate meteor showers, but I'm, I'm probably not gonna um, sit and wait for a meteor to happen, um, just because, again, this meteor shower is probably one meteor every one or two minutes. 
um, which is going to feel like a long time if we just sit here and wait for one. So I'm going to keep talking about the night sky. Maybe we'll see one happen. Um, and what I want to show you now is a galaxy. So in the, near the constellation Cassiopeia is the Andromeda galaxy, which is right here. Um, this is actually the most distant thing you can see with your naked eye. Um, and in a very, very dark night sky, you can actually see the Andromeda galaxy without the aid of any telescope or binoculars. Um, although, if you do have a pair of binoculars, this is a great galaxy to see. Um, this galaxy actually has an interesting relation to California and actually Mount Wilson. So in the beginning of the 20th century, people didn't know that there were other galaxies. They knew where there were these basically nebula in the sky that they called spiral nebula. So this was called the Andromeda Spiral Nebula. They didn't know it was a galaxy, and they had no idea how far away this galaxy was. Um, so it was a goal of astronomers to basically figure out how far away this uh, nebula was. And um, in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Hubble, Edwin Hubble, who the um, Hubble Space Telescope is named after, was basically the first to do that. And using the telescopes at Mount Wilson, um, just outside of LA, he was actually able, able to measure the distance to the Andromeda galaxy and find out that it is two and a half million light years away. Um, so it takes light two and a half million years to get from that galaxy um, to us, uh, for, for it to land in, in your eye if you look at it. Um, very far away. It's also actually approaching us. Um, so the Andromeda galaxy will probably collide with um, the Milky Way galaxy in about 5 million years. Um, now, if we're alive when that happens, you might think that that'll be probably a bad collision for us. The good news is that um, when galaxies collide, it doesn't really do much to the stars within them. So stars will be sort of flung all over the place, um, but stars are far enough apart from each other where the galaxies will pretty much mostly just pass through each other. Um, most sort of solar systems will be undisturbed. So it'll be a very beautiful display, but it probably won't be too bad for, um, for us if we're still around. All right, and late into the night, you're going to see another planet rising, uh, Mars. And then, of course, the moon is also rising. And the moon is, unfortunately, our enemy uh, at this time because the Perseids are happening. And we wish the moon wasn't here. Uh, but Mars will rise. Um, if you have a very powerful telescope, you might be able to see some features, but mostly it'll just be a sort of orange dot. Um, the moon is actually, uh, so the moon is at a quarter phase right now. It's not too bad an object to look at if you have some binoculars or um, a telescope. It's actually pretty good to look at the moon during a quarter phase. You might think it's, it's best to observe the moon during like a full moon, but during a full moon, the moon's really bright and the lighting on it is pretty flat. So if you look at the moon during a quarter phase, you'll see nice definition in the shadows of the craters. It'll be really an awesome view. Um, so if you are awake at this time, you can check out uh, the moon. All right, I'm going to pause, look for some more questions. All right, I don't see any new ones. Um, okay, so if you stay up until the uh, morning, you'll start to see some win winter constellations rising, Taurus and Orion. There is another open cluster near the moon, um, the Pleiades. Pleiades is also called the Seven Sisters, or uh, it's also called Subaru. So. If you look at the logo on Subaru cars, it's actually this um, open cluster. Um, and then Orion will rise. And in the very early morning, it's now 4 a.m., uh, the planet Venus will rise. And then if you're able to look at uh, the planet Venus with the telescope, you'll notice that the planet Venus actually has phases, just like the moon. That's because uh, Venus is interior to the sun. Um, from the planet Earth, 
And so right now it's actually almost in the same phase as the moon. It's in a quarter, fa a quarter phase. All right, so I mentioned uh, meteor storms, and Solarium will actually simulate meteor storms for us. So I thought we should take a look at that and see what those would be like. So I'm going to find us the meteor storm in 1833. Here it is. And I'll go back to when it's night. All right, and this is going to simulate how many meteors would be expected uh, on that night. Yeah, so needless to say, uh, it would have been quite a spectacular night um, to be alive. All right, well, that about um, ends our show for tonight. So I'll go ahead and take a look one more time just to see if there's any last questions. Uh, somebody asked a question, does uh, the meteor that ionized the atmosphere when the meteor entered the atmosphere um, stay in the atmosphere and become part of our atmosphere? So yes, all, all meteors that will fall into our atmosphere, even if they get vaporized, the dust will still remain in our atmosphere. Um, so they will sort of become part of our atmosphere. And actually, several hundred tons of uh, space debris falls into our atmosphere every single day um, and becomes part of our atmosphere. Okay, well, I think that about does it um, for tonight. So thank you everyone for attending this show. This is our, our first attempt at a virtual planetarium show. Um, so thanks for joining in and we'll, we'll try to um, host more of these events in the future. Um, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. And you can also check out our website. Um, and our planetarium is run completely by grad student volunteers. Um, so we appreciate you uh, showing your support um, in any way possible. But all right, with that, I'll wish you a good night, hopefully good viewing 